Okay, this is uh, the, the last 30 minutes where we'll finally go into this uh, base inference section. Uh, that's uh, the, the final application of base theorem in, 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 in the first half of uh, most of our time have been spent to build in emulators to fast to, to make fast predictions uh, uh, from the parameter space to to the predictions uh, to observables. Uh, of, of course, for Bayesian inference, we will first need a set of measurements. Uh, in this case, we are, so we're using toy models uh, to be so uh, uh, um, not physical to compare it to to real data. Uh, so we're, we're using what we call pseudo data. So pseudo data is also important in, in, this, in, this, in this workflow is that uh, the pseudo data uses model calculations from a specific set of parameters as data. Uh, this is very important because this is the, the case where we know what the true values of the parameters are. And we know that uh, there exist such parameters where the model should simply describe the data perfectly. Uh, so this is usually what we, we did before. We compare to real experimental data uh, to use pseudo data just, just to test if this workflow is working and whether we can, or, or to, to what degree we can recover the true values that we put in into the pseudo data. Uh, and here, I so these are the, the set of parameters that I chose for the, the the true set of parameters for the pseudo data. Uh, they are the normalization, uh, the minimum of eta over s, uh, high temperature slope, uh, low temperature slope, and finally, this the the separation temperature the, between high and low. This is the location of the king. Uh, it's a 180 MeV. And the experimental value is uh, the model calculation at these true sets of parameters. Uh, in order to put in some um, uncertainties in the measurements, uh, which is often, which is necessarily the case, uh, in this case, we only consider statistical fluctuations. Here, you can specify the level of statistical uncertainties. For example, in this case, it's a 5% standard deviations. And then it will generate uh, another normalized fluctuation around unity to modulate the data up and down with, uh, uh, with the, 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 the stat level that, 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 you, that, you, that you put in. But eventually, you don't know whether a particular point is fluctuated up and down. You only know that uh, <clears throat> on average, you get 5% of the statistical uncertainty. That's what we will provide the Bayesian analysis as the st stat error, which is the measured value times that 5% uncertainty level. And you can define the, because statistical uncertainties are, are uncorrelated from point to point. The corresponding uh, covariance matrix is a, takes the diagonal form uh, with the statistics, statistical uncertainty square as the matrix element. Uh, I mean, you can also choose your own sets of parameters, and and again, you can you can see whether this validation will work for every uh, parameters that you sample in your parameter space. But here, I will only use I'm going to only use. Uh, use, use this set. Run through block 19. Uh, it will show you what, what the pseudo data looks like. Uh, it's actually quite looks quite similar to the experimental data. Uh, you have a decreasing of uncharged particles versus centralities, and the V2 uh, uh, have this uh, for first going up. Uh, from central to proper collisions and drop down a little bit, right? Very proper collisions. And with this uh, data set specified, we can go ahead and define the likelihood functions and the posterior distributions. Uh, 
That's the almost the last step. Image is not defined. Oh, I forgot to run this. this one. Uh, so in block 20 is the the definition of prior, uh, uh, or in this case, the log of prior. Uh, so it, you give it the parameter points, it will simply check whether it's within the boundary of your design or outside of the boundary of design. Uh, if it's inside the boundary, then log of a constant is the constant uh, that will return zero because in currently we're, we're not so interested in the absolute value of the posterior. If it's outside of boundary, uh, the prior is zero and log of zero is minus infinity. And then it's the like, likelihood function. So the likelihood function, with, it takes this multivariate normal form. Uh, there is a determinant of the coherence matrix and this quadratic form. Uh, so here to, 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 to accelerate this process, we, we import a low level uh, linear algebra library from LaPeck uh, to, to do some fast uh, evaluation of the determinant and also the, 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 the this quadratic form. So the value it takes is, <clears throat> Uh, I think it's the this y is actually the difference between the emulator prediction uh, minus the experimental data, and the covariance will be a sum of uh, both the experimental covariance and the emulator covariance matrix. And finally, it uses the, these two informations to compute uh, this log likelihood. Finally, in block 12, uh, uh, 22, uh, it combines the prior and posterior to define the, 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 sorry, combine the prior and likelihood to define the posterior. And because we're taking the log, the product becomes the sum between uh, these two. Uh, so, 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 so whenever you, 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 you pass it a mode, set of modal parameters, it will use this uh, predict the mode, predict observable uh, function uh, to return the mean values. Uh, let me make it more informative. The mean values, but in this time we are going to re return the full correlated uh, covariance matrix uh, of 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 this uh, prediction vector, and. <clears throat> Uh, so this delta y is the differences between the mean and the experiments, and the variance is the predictor variance plus the experimental variance. And then finally, it's the sum of the log prior and log likelihood. Okay, finally, we will draw random samples from this posterior distribution using the Markov chain Monte Carlo method. <clears throat> this is uh, has been covered by Matt yesterday. Uh, so again, here you have this flag, uh, which is whether you want to run MCMC during the exercise. Uh, I will set it to true, but that will take us uh, some, some time to generate the samples. So what I'm going to do is I will let it generate less samples just for, for, for demonstration, demonstration process. Uh, you can also set to false and will load a, a pre-generated uh, chain of uh, random workers, uh, which which take, takes you no time. So I will run thousand steps, and I've initialized ten random workers per dimension, uh, and the first four hundred step will be discarded as uh, the burning step.
Nope. Uh, it's, oh, I forgot about this. Okay. Uh, so maybe if you are having a Zoom running, I will not recommend to 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 to, to rerun the chain the chain right now. It's uh, taking longer than I saw. Okay, I think this is taking too long and this is just burning steps. Uh, I'm going to stop it and uh, just load uh, the pre-generated results. Okay. So, 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 uh, I think as long as you haven't finished uh, I have, have, have finished the, the MCMC, it will not override the, the pre-generated chain that I, 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 I send with this uh, notebook. Uh, so if you, you stop the, the, the MCMC immediately, then you're, you will be able to, to, to reload the chain. So this, this chain shows the first, uh, so this table will show the first five samples uh, in, in the chain and of course, we have to, to plot it in that corner plot to see what's really going on. Uh, so keep running to block 25. Okay, then you have this uh, posterior uh, 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 posterior plot for uh, 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 of the chain that you just load. Uh, so, so here on the because you have five parameters, uh, it's impossible to really visualize the five dimensional posterior distribution. So, so, so here on, on a two D graph. We can show on the diagonal plot is the single parameter distribution after uh, the model to data comparison, and uh, within which each of them uh, there are two line, two vertical lines. Uh, one of them is colored in red. That's the truth value that you put in into the pseudo data. The other one is uh, what we define as the central estimation. In this case, I think it's the median of the this 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 one variate uh, of this one parameter distribution. So, so by median, you, uh, I mean the 50% of the the, the the samples are are smaller than the median, and another 50 are greater than median. Uh, and on the alpha diagonals is the two parameter joint distributions, where you can see how these parameters are correlated. Uh, First, if you look at this normalization, it's really well constrained around the true values, and it's almost coincide with the central estimations. However, you 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 cannot always just use the central estimation to represent all the, the knowledge that we get in this post posterior. So the posterior contains far more richer knowledge than just a, a central estimation set. Uh, it contains the uncertainties and also how one parameter is correlated to the other. So don't just report the central estimation without uh, an understanding of the, the, the full distribution. For the other four parameters, this A, B, C, D, uh, 
because our parameterization is quite arbitrary, we, we just put the piecewise linear, you can also use other parameterizations. So it's not, don't make too much sense to, to just focus on one of them because their meaning can vary significantly when you change to a different parameterization. So instead, we can pull random samples from A, B, C, D from these posteriors and plot what the actual shear viscosity looks like. That's the physical quantities that actually governs the, the toy model. Yeah, so if you run through block 58, sorry, block 26, it will sample uh, a thousand set, uh, uh, parameter sets from the posterior and then compute the shear viscosity. So in this case, the shear viscosity, both the prior distribution and the posterior distribution are shown uh, in 30, 60, 90, and 95 percent credible interval marginalized on each temp uh, at, at, at in each individual temperature. The black lines uh, that, 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 that's in the middle is the, is the true value of the Putin, and the, this dash line is this, the central estimation. Uh, so the so one thing that you notice immediately is that uh, uh, not all the viscosities at each temperature are, are calibrated, uh, are, 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 are constrained to the same level. So in this, in this current example, seems that we get two bottlenecks, sorry, two necks in the posterior distribution, one around 150 MeV, another one around 400 MeV. So at least within this parameterization, it seems that these two temperatures are constrained better than other temperature ranges. Uh, for other temperature ranges, especially when you go to high temperature, because essentially there's some there's no data at high temperatures. So the highest temperature reached in our fireball uh, is below, for example, 60, 600 MeV. So we should expect that uh, uh, a reasonable parameterization should give back the, uh, the, the prior range when your temperature is very far from where the data actually want to constrain. Uh, Finally, in addition to just look at the posterior, uh, it's also very important to look at uh, observables because, because just looking at this plot doesn't tell you whether the data is it's, it's well reproduced or, or poorly reproduced. Mm, because usually you get a very tightly constrained posterior, but that comes from the model has very large tension with the data. For example, you can always fit a linear function to a quadratic data, but uh, and get very tightly constrained slope, but that's meaningless because the observables are not well reproduced. So in the block 27 and block 28, a very important thing to check is that you make another, for example, 100 set of samples from the posterior chain, and again, run these samples through the toy model and to see whether uh, the, the model predictions from the uh, posterior samples actually reproduce the data well. And this is what's shown here. Uh, the first row is the direct comparison uh, of the posterior, so the, 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 the red band to, and prior, which is the blue band, and also the pseudo data. And in the bottom row, as the ratio to the pseudo data. So there are some fluctuations because the pseudo data contains 5% uh, fluctuations. So that's why when you take the, the ratio, it's, uh, <clears throat> this band also, also fluctuates. But you can kind of see that uh, the, uh, the posterior exam, sorry, the, the parameters from the posterior chance does uh, give you a pretty good description uh, of the data. Uh, but of course, again, this is a quite uh, mm, qualitative way of seeing the fit is good. Uh, uh, otherwise, you can, for example, print out the actual value of the, the likelihood functions or compute the evidence uh, for, for this model to, 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 to quantify uh, the model's ability to describe the data. 
So this completes this notebook. So I think in the in the last 10 minutes, uh, I will take the questions and the, I would like also point out a few things to try. Uh, because when you apply this framework to an actual physical model, it's always, uh, the, there, are, there are always room for improvement and uh, and here are some things to try uh, to, to, to give you a better idea of, of w which factor play to play what role in this in this uh, in this analysis. So the first thing to try is that if you still remember when we define the effective shear viscosity, we take the temperature average of e over s times t to some power. And then previously we take that power to be minus one. So, so this is what we did right now. And if you have time, I, I will encourage you to try power equals to minus three. So this will further decrease the importance of the shear viscosity at the hand temperatures and see if your toy model will respond to viscosity in this way, whether you can still get such good constraint at high temperatures. And the second one is you can change the uncertainty level of the pseudo data. Currently it's 5%. You can change it either up and down to 10% or 4%, 2%, uh, and see whether your uncertainty band always decreases uh, with decreasing experimental uncertainty and uh, at which point you are actually limited by the bottleneck that your, your emulator has finite uncertainties. Uh, you can always change the number of principal components uh, to make sure that the three, three features that we included in the dimension reduction is really enough to generate stable results. Uh, you can try turn that uh, use nonlinear transformation flag on and off. Uh, and, and force Gaussian process to learn something that clear, clearly not normally distributed and see what happens. Uh, you can also try, for example, only calibrate to one of the centrality classes. Uh, for this, just delete for example, or comment out uh, that Trento data, comment out other centralities and only leave one centrality. And I think the workflow will, 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 will be, uh, will, will be available to uh, uh, apply to, to a different uh, input file. Uh, and finally, it's actually an, another very interest, interesting point you can try on your own, is that currently we're using pseudo data where we know there is one set of parameters that describe the data ac accurately, infinitely accurately. But the realistic case is that nature will probably not have a piecewise linear uh, shear viscosity of so function of temperature. So what if uh, you use a different uh, parameterization for it over s that generate the pseudo data while still use the piecewise linear as a parameterization uh, to try to extract uh, the functional form of it over s over, uh, versus t. Uh, so this will belongs to the class of theoretical uncertainties and is very important question also to answer when you replay uh, when you replace the real data in the place of the pseudo data and uh, given that we may not be able to parameterize the true form of it of s then what is the how to understand this this results uh, basically how to, to, to what degrees are these results parameterization dependent okay so uh, maybe in the next two days, you can try out uh, this variance of this notebook and you can post your questions regarding to this, this question, either to current version or this variance to, to Slack and uh, I will try to answer that. Okay. Yeah, Yanji, I think uh, uh, I'm done with the most of the materials. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot. So, um, 
Do we have any last minute questions before we close the section? Let me see if uh, there are any hands. I didn't see any. All right, so probably uh, we can close the session uh, today. Uh, thanks a lot for everybody and uh, Wei Yao. It's a nice uh, uh, lecture. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.